<clears throat> Good afternoon, esteemed members of the IAB. I am Rudy Moran, the chief engineer of the Chimera Mate ROV. My teammates are Julian Groll, Julian Groll, propulsion engineer, Daniel Penna, the structures engineer, and Julian Sullen, the power engineer. So the problem statement and the mission behind this uh, this actual competition is that OSSI, Ocean Space Systems, Ocean Space Systems, and NASA came together and they wanted to make a dual purpose ROV that can operate both in space and in the ocean. So the Explorer class is what the universities compete in. We're given a 48 volt, 40 amp power supply. Uh, some challenges are to waterproof everything because that's to stay submerged for an extended period of time. And the compact design also because the more it weighs and the bigger it is, the more it costs to go send it, send it to space. So there's several tasks that we need to do, demonstrations. The most, the most prominent one is the one we need to compete at the regional event. We're gonna be showing video of this later on in the presentation. The mission to Europa. We have to take a, a little piece through some waypoints that you'll see in the video. And other demonstrations that are listed here are basically we have to make sure we have maneuverability, that our manipulator works, and also that we can bring the stuff and retrieve it back to the surface. The technical, the technical documentation, we have a user manuals also in the report and that we have to submit to the competition. So the division responsibilities we had, and since uh, we're all new to this, we took a look at the MATE website and we saw that they had an underwater robotics book. And on that book, they split these, uh, the actual ROV components into several categories. And so we split them into our, our team and basically the titles that were given as power propulsion or structure is how we labeled everything else. So to begin the navigation controls, we have to learn LabVIEW. LabVIEW gives you both Arduino or Lynx software uh, interface. We chose to go with Lynx because it compiles both read and write functions into one, and we can easily work with that. Uh, learning new software is way easier to, uh, to work with. So we use the Lynx for Arduino controller. This is an example of a block diagram here. This is an initialization. This is how the servos open, and these are the channels in which they're linked to. So as Rudy was saying, we're using a lab view. And this is our control schematic on our joystick. So to raise and lower the, the gripper arm, simple on the D-pad here. To open and close the gripper is the trigger buttons. We have a forward and reverse thrust, and then left and right turn, ascend, descend. These raw joystick uh, inputs have to be converted into pulse width modulation values. That's the only thing that either the servo motor or the electronic speed controller can read. So how do we do that? Is again through LabVIEW. Now this is this entire thing is a while loop, so it's a very visual programming language. It's easy to see and easy to troubleshoot where your data is going. So here we have the joystick being initialized. We have the different buttons from the joystick and also the different analog buttons. So the two joysticks on the, on the front of it. And these are the raw the raw uh, data that's coming from the joystick. However, with these functions. We feed these values into it. Let's say we want to go forward thrust. You know, we get a maximum value, so negative 32,000. It's going to go into the function, and then we're going to get a respective pulse width in microseconds, 1,700 microseconds, let's say, which is uh, maximum forward thrust. And then here we have two case structures that control what the, the gripper does. It goes up to a maximum point, goes down to a maximum point. It opens up uh, maximum amount and closes. To navigation, let's talk about final design. For the final design, we um, decided to go with a box-like structure, as you can see here. It protects all our, all our main components, uh, our thrusters, uh, all our thrusters, our canisters, where our programming is. Uh, this, and also, we use the lightweight extrusion aluminum. Basically, it has holes running through the whole side to make it as uh, through the through the inside to make it as light as possible. You can't really see it here, but each one of the corners has a hole in it. And then, uh, on top of that, our thrusters, as you can see here, are we're all, we're using vector thrusting. So basically, uh, we have like a max moment uh, to the center of, to the center of mass of, of our robot. So it allows for a lot a lot of a lot easier of a maneuverability in the water. And then using this, when you're going forward, your two side vectors cancel out, so you just go straight back either way, and then you turn a lot easier as well. And then once our final design was done, we went into our construction of our ROV. Uh, the first thing we had to do was cut each one of these frames to size, and then tap each each frame in the corner in order to use these three corner, these corner, three-way corner brackets in order to secure everything in place. And then once that was done, we had we added our motor mounts here in the corner and we had to modify them in order to fit them to the angle that we wanted and our, the placement of our pressure canister uh, that we had purchased as well. 
and then this would th that be our initial build. And then once we go from our initial build, we go to the wiring of our entire robot. From here, uh, the main thing we had to do, as mentioned before, was convert our voltage from 48 to 12. And then this was basically uh, with, the, with the wiring. This is like a wiring challenge because we had to basically put in 24 wires coming in and out just to convert the power. Then another uh, 18 wires just for the thrusters, and then another one for power and for USB cables coming out. And this all had to come out of the back end of our ROV. Air clear, and it had to be waterproof. And as we noticed, and we were told in the beginning, the biggest challenge that we were going to have was waterproofing. And at the end, the biggest challenge we had was waterproofing. <laughs> Yeah, we ended up we ended up uh, filling in the entire back end with a with a, like a resin. It's basically an epoxy resin. Basically, we made a pot uh, in the back that completely sealed the back end. We've had it now hours in, in the water and without any water going in. Here, these are O-rings, and then we also I also lubricated it with lithium grease to try to have another barrier just to make sure no water goes in. And then once the wires go in, they go to the electronic speed controllers, which are then hooked up to. Um, fuses and then go to the to the Arduino to get the signal. Then finally troubleshooting, once the code was already done, uh, we had to make sure all our thrusters worked, our gripper was working correctly, and then our final design, putting it in the water, putting it in the water and checking the buoyancy, doing all the buoyancy tests, making sure it were slightly positive to be buoyant because it helps with uh, nav navigating, it's a little bit easier. Uh, and, and then once, and then now to further explain the circuitry, Julius Edmonton. All right, so the main competition provides us with a 48 volt, 40 amp power supply. Uh, this is pretty much given to us to show that university level students are able to handle this kind of power. Um, the power supply was recreated by putting uh, four 12 volt batteries in series to get the 48 volts. And uh, the batteries will be connected to the ROV via a tether, which can be seen right here. Um, the tether consists of three cables total, one positive cable, one negative cable, and then the USB cable for signals um, from the top side to the ROV. Um, another requirement by the competition is that all voltage regulation must be done on board the ROV. Nothing can be done top side. Just another thing that, to prove that we can handle this type of power. So basically, the competition also mandates that we turn in an electronic system interconnection diagram. Basically, what this shows is a top-level view of the components in our ROV. It's something simple so that way uh, people can understand it. So, basically, what we have here is we uh, at the top we've got the 48 volt power supply, which is connected, which branches off into two different subsections. The first one uh, I'll talk about is the 48 to 5 volt uh, battery eliminator circuit. Basically, what this does is it provides power to our USB hub, constant power, which is very important because if we were to use any other sort of uh, conversion it would have voltage spikes and we would lose uh, power to the Ar uh, Arduino and the ROV would just sink to the ground. Uh, to this USB hub, we have the USB camera and the two Arduinos, one Arduino being mainly used for navigation and control and the other one for uh, sensors on board. The, the second uh, branch is for the thrusters mainly. Um, it branches off into the six buck converters, which converts the 48 to 12, since our uh, thrusters all run on 12 volts. These buck converters then get connected to the electronic speed controller, six of them for each thruster, and then finally to each thruster. So while the thrusters will be getting their voltage regulated, the current also needs to be regulated to ensure that the thrusters aren't constantly spinning while we're inside the water. So the LabVIEW interface has an integrated uh, power regulation system within the software. So essentially what this does is the user sends a command on the controller down to the ROV through pulse width modulation and the ESC receives this pulse width modulation and allows for a certain current to flow through to each thruster. Based on uh, our configuration, we had 1700 as our max forward thrust, which would give us approximately 3.41 amps to each thruster, which corresponded to about four pounds of thrust. Um, as far as incorporating global design into our thing, I mean into our ROV, we, uh, wanted, we decided to pick something that was um, relevant to what's going on in industry right now. So we chose this because it involves space exploration because we're going to Europa and to find a sustainable life and you know more water and stuff like that up there. Um, we also incorporated internationally recognized symbols into our design, what well, we will once we do our final test tomorrow for the competition, as well as an easy to use instruction manual in uh, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. 
So if this is a, an actual cost breakdown. We had a, a budget of about $4,300. You can see here the thrusters and the enclosure came out to about 48% of our cost because these were really actually the most important part of it. the thrusters uh, and the, both waterproof the thrusters and the enclosure. The end effector, we got a simple end effector off of eBay and then we retrofitted it with waterproof servos so that uh, we were estimating that to be initially $1,000 and that came out to a lot less money. The structure was donated, however, we left this here in case this was the remanufactured, we have to include this, uh, this price here. And things like lights, the camera sensors, um, they were pretty inexpensive, however, again, another big chunk of the cost was the electrical components. The BEC itself, um, $100 right there, batteries, etc. So it came out to about 500. However, we were still under 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 um, our projected cost by about 44 percent. We spent 2,400 dollars total on this prototype. And this is our Gantt chart. Right now, we're in the testing phase, so we've been um, testing on and off to make sure that we're competing um, properly because we have to submit a video uh, by May 1st to Mate, showing that we can actually complete this one single task within 15 minutes in one run no cuts, no nothing in the video, and so that's where we are right now. Um, quick test that we also did was a drag test. What we did was we towed the ROV in the water for uh, five meters at different uh, uh, drag uh, readings. We timed them. With that, we were able to get uh, this graph here, which measures the time versus, um, excuse me, velocity versus uh, tension. With the frontal area known, the velocity unknown, we are able to calculate now the drag coefficient of this of the shape, which is unique. At 1700 pulse width modulation, we have tested our ROV, and we got about 0.45 meters per second in the water. Our theoretical maximum at that much pulse width modulation is about 0.54, so we have a 16.7% error. We reduced the pulse width modulation just a little bit because we felt that there was too much thrust and we were um, being thrown off the bar. So this is a quick. So basically, this was our uh, first go inside the water when we were getting uh, accustomed to the controls. It was a little difficult at first, but uh, we wanted to try to knock out the task in one ride anyway. Um, so basically, here we are. We lowered the ROV into the water, and our first goal is to try to open um, this little door right here. So here we are maneuvering over to the door and uh, cut through to the door scene because it did take us a, a little while to get over there based on the controls. So here we are opening the door for the environmental sample processor, which I'll show later on in the video. Uh, you, oh, we're opening up the door here. And then we do, after we open this door, we head back to the environmental sample processor to grab that. This is the, um, the regional task that we need to accomplish in order to qualify for the international competition. So here we are picking up the environmental sample processor. There it is right there. And that environmental sample processor has a rope running uh, right behind it and we need to drag it up to these little waypoints right here. And you'll see them on this right here, these little waypoints. We need to drag the rope through there and then place the environmental sample processor inside this little PVC structure over here. And here's a video of us getting it inside. Uh, we didn't get it in all one trial, but uh, tomorrow we will be completing our last task to try to see if we can get it in the 15 minutes for the international competition. There it is. Right, so what this all comes down to is design experience for us as a team, and the reason we took on this project was to get exposure to different types of engineering in total. So with engineering software, we, uh, we took on the challenge of learning new software. We weren't taught here at FIU. Uh, we wish that we were. It would have saved us a lot of time. Uh, nevertheless, it, it was really good software. And as an engineer going into industry, you're never told what you're supposed to learn. You have to learn new products. You have to learn new software. And so this basically prepares us for that lifelong learning that they keep telling us in school that we're going to need. And so this definitely was a, a great project towards that. This, uh, as before, I said before, this was a multidisciplinary project. A power engineer had to find some friends over in electrical engineering, and he went and he was also talking to them to make sure that his uh, circuit was manageable and that it was safe. So the future outlook that we have here, we want to make sure uh, the manipulator arm right now only has one degree of freedom. We're looking into possibly we have we can make some changes prior to the competition in a month. 
And so we wanted to go ahead and see if we can use more degrees of freedom for the arm, as shown in that video, it's quite tough to get that, that uh, the environmental sample processor in the PVC pipe. The thruster alignment, we thought that maybe it was a little off, maybe the degrees weren't quite ex as exact as when we're thrusting forward. We have an error of like maybe gearing here uh, left to right, and that accumulates into our error that we found 16.7%. Also, a lighter structure material that we can have, uh, the buoyancy, maybe even some ballast tanks that we can include. The com uh, we're very confident that we're going to complete the challenges when we're taken uh, into this competition once we submit this video. And also, we're going to be representing FIU of in the upcoming robotic conference with two papers we submitted. The first one being of the ROV, the structure, everything, from navigation and controls. And secondly, the follow up of making it autonomous. Are there any questions? Well, making it waterproof is really a big challenge, and running it this long without any problems is really. First time we had it. It's not easy because we know from previous years teams and stuff that was a real big challenge. We, we we definitely had it in the pool for about thirty seconds, saw some droplets of water, and we're like, all right, let's. Uh, and then, uh, There's too much money invested. In yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're like, all right, so let's let's just pretty much enclose but this. But still, you pull it up in a relatively yeah. short period, yeah, so that, of, that's really it's it's not as simple as it looks right now. Right, we, I mean, so. uh, th there's different, uh, actually the, the flotation, how, how we're going to make it neutrally buoyant, because as soon as it's neutrally buoyant, it's a putting the sample environment, environmental sample process becomes a little easier. Right now we're a little positive, we changed uh, the buoyancy or the PVC, we instead we had some foam on there, but now we replace it with PVC, so now we can just add weight to make it neutrally buoyant, which is a whole lot easier than just you know, adding foam here and there, left and right. Yeah. Foam would eventually saturate and we'd start sinking again, so PVC is so a better way to do it. Constantly have to make adjustments, on, constantly have to make adjustments underneath the water to try to stay neutral and then putting the environmental sample processor in there, it's just wobbling back and forth and back and forth. Right. And Julian is the operator, so he's the experienced yeah. speaker. Yeah. So right. he's, he's running. Easy at all. Um, <laughs> he's definitely experienced with different things. Uh, Julian had, he had a function, uh, function generator that he used for the controls, and we actually changed a few of those to linear instead of a parabola shape. And we found that in linear, uh, the linear actual formula or equation, it drove a whole lot straighter and it was actually more responsive. So we've definitely gone to the next level trying to make sure that we're ready for the competition. Go ahead. I have a question. The competition is, is it in the swimming pool or is it like out in the ocean? Yeah, it's going to be located at the Johnson Space Center in the Triple Y&T Lab in Houston, Texas. Oh, okay. It'll take place at about 12 meters. Right. They, they, they block it off at a certain distance. That's your depth. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.